All right, so uh, why don't we just warm up a little bit to start. Yesterday we did integration by part, so let's just start with one, just for fun. <coughs> let's integrate x times cosine of x. Right, now let's first do it the long way, and then we'll do it the, the tic-tac-toe method. So recall, when we do integration by parts, we're, we're trying to utilize this formula. The integral of dv is uv minus the integral of the du. So what you try to do is you set up uh, your inside function so it looked like some function times another function times dx and then right that function times dx to be your dv and then the other function is u. And then you could switch the roles of u and v. Right? Instead of having a dv, you look at v. Instead of having a u, you look at du. You get a new integral, which in principle could be easier. So let's let's give it a shot here. Now we had this nice little mnemonic: right? lines in Africa tackle elephants, or hopefully somebody will come up with a better one for me. Right? And this told us which one we should choose as our u, and which one should go into the dv. And remember, this L meant logarithmic functions, I was inverse trig, A was algebraic, which meant polynomials, rational functions, T was trig, and E was exponential. So in this case, we have an algebraic and a trig. So algebraic comes before trig, so the algebraic should be my case. And everything else then has to be the DC. Okay, so if u equals x and dv equals cosine of x dx, then what is du equal to? dx. And what is v equal to? Then we can take sine of x. Okay, so with this, then we get that our integral of x, cosine of x dx equals, well, by this formula, right, we can swap the u and the dv, and we pick up a uv, so x sine of x, minus the integral of v du, so sine of x dx. And sure enough, we have simplified our integral. Instead of having an x times cosine of x, we just have a sine of x. Okay, and what is the antiderivative of sine of x? Negative cosine of x is one of them. Yep, I said the. Of course, we really mean a. So the integral will be negative cosine of x plus c. Now, we had a negative cosine of x and another negative, so it becomes positive cosine of x plus c. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, You might have noticed, ah, this is one of those things where you have a polynomial and then a trig function or an exponential function. So you just use this tic-tac-toe method. Right? You write x over here, you write cosine of x, and you differentiate until you get to 0. So derivative of x is 1, derivative of 1 is 0. And then you anti-differentiate as many times as you differentiate. So antiderivative of cosine is sine. And antiderivative of sine? Cosine. All right, connect with diagonal lines. Always start with plus, and alternate, plus, minus. And so the answer is x sine of x minus minus is plus cosine of x plus c. Okay. So there's your shortcut method to doing right? And it's really, this is just a way of taking all this nonsense and putting it into a nice little table. Okay? Any questions? Or is it the not so bad? All right, now you remember yesterday we used integration by parts to find the antiderivative of ln of x, right? which was a little strange because there wasn't a product of functions, which is somehow what integration by parts is built for. Right? It's supposed to be for a product of functions. But ln of x is just the, really the one function, and, but we still were able to get an answer. So let's try that again on another integral. Let's 
try to do arc sine of x. We haven't talked too much about inverse trace functions, but these are important too. So, okay, if I, I mean, you have no idea probably offhand what's the antiderivative of arc sine. So, you give it a shot. You say, well, let's try this integration by parts again. Okay, so, what do I make my u and what do I make my dv? Arc sine is u. Arc sine is u, right? Not so many choices. And then the dv has to be everything else, so just dx. Okay. Well, let's see. Let's do the easy thing first. V. What's v? If dv equals dx. Right? Okay, that's the easy part. And what's du equal? Hey, he's already late to remember something. This is good. <laughs> he's 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Yeah. Wow! 1 minus x squared. I'm impressed. You guys remember this. This is really great. Good, good, good. Okay, now, remember the nice thing about integration by parts is you can take things you don't know how to integrate and instead of turn it into a differentiation problem, right? And we all know how to differentiate. So this is not so bad. So, okay. We need uv. So x arc sine minus the integral of v du. So I have x times 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. So I can write this as x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Here we, here we start to get a little nervous, don't we? <laughs> that looks awfully darn complicated. No. Okay. So let's let's pause there. Because we don't know what to do. So we'll leave this up then. Leave this up on the board and hopefully we'll be inspired over the course of the uh, the day to solve it. But boy, we're, we're pretty stuck right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, as you say, when you can't do something, do something else. So It's always annoying when you have a warm-up question and you just get stuck on it. Uh, just try to do something else. Maybe, maybe you figure it out somehow. Okay, so today, we're going to talk about another technique of integration called integration by substitution. Sometimes it's also called U substitution. And I'll set up all the notation so that that makes, makes sense. Uh, so we'll try to go through this. Uh, I don't think we'll have time for it, but if we do, we'll also talk about something called integrating factors. And if we don't have time, we'll just start it up on Tuesday. So let's talk about substitution. So remember we had this nice table, right? And the table, you know, it had uh, derivatives and then antiderivatives. And you had uh, the power rule. And this corresponded to the power rule. You had power rule differentiation, power rule for integration. We have linearity for differentiation. Right? It means you can derivative of a sum is a sum of derivatives. You can pull out constants. And this corresponded to linearity of integration. Uh, we talked about the product rule for differentiation, and this became what? Integration by parts. Integration by parts. So the last big rule that we had, mind you, the quotient rule is really just the product rule in a different form. The last big rule we have is the chain. And that is what is going to turn in to substitution. So 
if you ever remember, if you ever forget what these things are, then you just remember where they came from. You can rederive the whole rule if you like. Okay. So let's start with the chain rule and use it to build some formula for substitution. And the way we've done this every single time, right, is we write down the differential, right, the when we had the product rule, we wrote down d type of uv, right, d u v, and then we wrote the other side of that, and that helped us build a, a formula for integration by parts. So for the chain rule, well, remember the chain rule had to do with what happens when you take the derivative of a composition of functions, right? You compose two functions, you know, x plus three quantity squared, right? That's a composition of two functions, x plus three and x squared. So let's say I have two functions, u and v, and I compose them. First I do u, then I do v. Okay. Now if I do d v composed to u, then what is this by, by definition? Say that again. By definition, what is d v composed to u? Well, look, just generally, right, if you have d something, then this is equal to something something derivative times dx. Right? Remember if you have du, this is u prime dx. Always, no matter what u is. Okay, so this becomes v composed u prime dx. Now, the chain rule is exactly set up for this situation. You have a composition of functions and you take the derivative. And what the chain rule says is you take the derivative of this function and evaluate it at your original second function u. And then you multiply this function by the derivative of u. Okay? The derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. That's the way, usually the way we think about it, right? And then, of course, you need this dx. Okay. Let's do a quick example so you remember what was going on. If I took the derivative of, uh, let's say, sine of x squared, what was this? Um, cosine? To the uh, power of 2. So you, you say cosine squared? Uh, yeah. right, it's cosine of x squared times, times the derivative of x squared to 2x. So see what you've done here. Okay? You have the outside function, that's your v, and your inside function is the u squared. The derivative of v, right, which in this case is sine, is cosine. You have a u on the inside, and you still evaluate it at u and x squared. But then you multiply by u prime. Well, u prime is 2x. Okay, so it's just what the chain rule tells you to do. Okay, so we have this nice equation. Let's integrate. Okay. Class on integration. If I integrate d v composed of u, it should be the same as things integrating uh, v prime composed u, u prime dx. But before I go through with this any further, what is u prime times dx equal? du. du, right? So I actually can make this a du. Okay, so on the left hand side, what do I get? If I integrate d anything, what do I get? Anything. anything. <laughs> right? So if I integrate d v composed u, I get v composed u. So what this means, so this is going to be one version of the substitution formula.
if I can arrange things so that I have right, a function v, right, or in this case I, I have the, the derivative of a function v, evaluated at some other function u, and, and then whatever I have left is just the derivative of u. When I integrate it, I just get v composed u out. Okay, so just like integration by parts, this formula should mean like nothing to you. You need to be like, okay, whatever, dude. <laughs> Funny math, man, great. Okay, so let's do some examples. See how this is really working. Start easy. Okay, why don't you integrate x plus 1 to the 1 half? <coughs> now, if this was a derivative problem, what rule would you be using? Chain rule. Okay, whenever you look at a problem and you say, boy, if that was a derivative, I'd be a lot happier. But if, I, if that was a derivative, I would use the chain rule. It's a very good bet. When you integrate, there's probably a chain rule. Or, well, we don't call it the chain rule anymore. We call it substitution. So you, you're supposed to have an inside function and an outside function. And here you can see, right, the u is the inside, the v is the outside. And over here, I have an inside function, x plus 1, and the outside function, which is raised to the 1 half power. So what this formula tells me is I would like to be able to uh, rewrite this whole expression just in terms of an inside function or an outside function. I want to assign all right, my u and my v to something. So let's say I, I call this the u part. Well, this formula tells you I need to figure out what du is. So I have any chance. So what is, if u is x plus 1, what is du? One. 1 times dx, right? Okay. So that means I could actually rewrite this as u to the 1 half power. I've just taken x plus 1 and written it as a u. And then, well, dx just becomes du. And now this is a much easier problem, because I can use which rule of? Power rule. So what do I get? I get, yeah, I've got to add 1, so I get 3 halves. And then it has to be 1 over 3 halves. Of course, plus c. Of course, what is 1 over 3 halves? Okay. 2 thirds, right? It flips things. So I get 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus c. Now, this looks pretty nice. It's, I started with x's and I ended up with a u. But this is not so hard, right? I, I know what u is. u is x plus 1. So I just have that. Probably without comment, you could figure out why this method is called substitution, or even use substitution. OK, why don't we try another example? Let's make this slightly more complicated. We just toss a 5 in here. Shouldn't matter much, but it's a constant amongst correct. Okay. Again, you look at it, and you say, if we were taking derivatives, this would be a chain rule problem. But we're integrating, so this is probably a substitution problem. I have an inside, I have an outside. So let's see what happens if I let u be the inside. Make that my u. So u is 5x plus 1. Then what is d? 5dx. So if I wanted to rewrite this, it would be u to the 1 half 
And now dx, oh, that's no good, right? I, here I just said, ah, oh, dx is du, so I can make it a du. But if I want to put a du in, which is what I need, I actually end up 5 times dx. So what can I do? What can I do? Right. I need to get a 5 dx in here somehow. How can I get a 5 dx in? Well, you can't just multiply by 5. I mean, you're not allowed to do that. You change the whole thing. If you multiply by 5, then what do you have to do to, to make it the same equation? Divide by 5. Divide by 5. So I can certainly do this. That, that's true still. Okay. Uh, but we know something about integration. If I have constants, what can I do? I can, I can pull them out. I don't have to pull them all out if I don't want to. I can pull out some, leave others. I have choices. You can't stop me. So let me just pull out this one fifth. Now in doing that, I now have a 5dx. And the 5dx I can into a du. And now I've gotten back the exact same integral that we solved over here. It's going to turn out to be 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus c. Plus this 1 fifth in the front. Right? Okay, so we get a fifth times 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus c, but of course I can just pull the plus c out to the constant. Okay, so I get 2 over 15, but this u I don't want, right? I really want it in terms of x's in the end, so I have to replace this with 5x plus 1 3 halves. So, when you end up with a constant, that you don't have, well, you just put it in, but then you have to invert it and put it out front. Okay. Another way to see that is when you get to this 5 dx equals du, you could divide by 5. And you could say, ah, dx equals du over 5. So I could just replace this immediately, dx with du over 5, and then, then I can just pull the, the one fifth out. You think about it in two different ways. So you get the same thing. Okay, uh, let's try another one. Okay, these are getting nastier. Okay, now this is much worse. Over here, when we had x plus 1 to the 1 half, okay, you have a function right, of a function. Function of a function. But now we got a lot of stuff floating around. We got a function of a function, all right? We divide the function by a function, and this is nasty. Wouldn't want to guess the antiderivative of this, yeah? Okay, so let's see that it's actually not so bad. All right, well, Again, if this was a derivative problem, oh, we're forgetting, of course, yes. If this was a differentiation problem, you'd say, well, I need to use the quotient rule. Okay. And then when you got to this part, you'd say, ah, I'm going to have to use the chain rule. Okay. Well, again, you see this chain rule popping up, and you think it's not a bad idea to try substitution. Okay. So what if I made that into my u? U is 4x squared plus 3. So what is du going to be? 8x dx. 8 times x dx. Right? Just the derivative of 4x squared plus 3. Okay, so let's see what happens if I try to plug everything back in. Let's see. I get an x over u to the 6 dx. Okay, now, I, instead of writing it as du equals 8x dx, I could equivalently write this as du over 8x equals dx. Just 
by dividing. And so everywhere I see dx, I could replace it with du over 8x. And now look what happens. This is really neat. Okay, well, first there's a constant. You can pull constants out. No problem there. But I have an x divided by x. That x on the top goes away. And so I'm just left with du over u to the 6. Or if you prefer, u to the minus 6 du. So we've now taken this exceptionally difficult looking integral that you would never want to guess, and we've turned it into a simple power rule problem. So let's see, what do I get? Uh, I can add one to the exponent, and then I do one over that new exponent. So negative one over 40, u to the minus five versus plus c. And then in the end, of course, I always have to plug my original u back in, so 4x squared plus 3. Go to minus 5. Or if you don't like negative exponents, negative 1 over 40 times 4x squared plus 3. And if you don't believe it, you can check it just by differentiating. I would say I have a product of functions, and if you have a product of functions, what do you want to use? Integration by parts. So there's actually a nice substitution way to do this, okay, which is going to make this even faster. Right? With integration by parts, I mean, this is a very nice method, but one, you have to choose things correctly, and you have to choose a u and a dv, and you have to differentiate one and integrate the other. When you do substitution, you just have to choose your u and differentiate. Right, so somehow half the battle. Well, here, what happens if I choose u to be my sign? What's going to be the derivative? It would be the cosine dx, right? So it's all just going to go away. So it's, it's right. You get u equals sine of x. du then equals cosine of x dx. And so this just becomes the integral of u du. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, this is a half u squared plus c, and then of course you have to put it back in at the end. And you get a half sine squared x plus c. It's pretty slick. Okay. I forgot how fast. But if I'm going too fast, let me please just let me know. Is this, is this pace okay, or is this really fast? No? Okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, okay, let's do one more. All right, so I want to integrate this. And, well, first I see a square root. Mind you, look how close this is to the one we wanted. Not quite the same, right? We don't have the x. We don't have the x up there. Okay, so I don't like these square roots because they're hard to do math you know, when these are around. So I always turn this into right, to the one half pattern. Okay, so this looks like a substitution problem, right? Because I have right, a function of a function function of a function. So what would be my u here? 
1 minus x squared. 1 minus x squared. Okay, so let's say u equals 1 minus x squared. So du is going to be 2x. 2x dx. Okay, so if I like, I'll, I can always solve for dx. And I get that uh, dx is du over negative 2x. Okay. So now I can rewrite this. The integral of 1 over u to the 1 half. And then dx is du over negative 2x. But now here's a problem. I can pull this minus 2 out. That's no, no big deal. But I still have this x floating around. And x is not a constant. X is a variable. Linearity says you can pull out constants. It doesn't say you can pull out variables. There's just, there's just no way around this. So it turns out this is a problem that does not yield to the substitution method. It just doesn't, doesn't play out that way. Now, if you remember what Lace said earlier, the derivative of arc sine was 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, which means what's the antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared? It's arc sine. So actually, the answer to this problem is arc sine of x. So some of them they don't yield, but you actually just have to go back into your memory banks and say, wait a second, that comes from something. A similar problem will occur, for instance, if you look at this integral. If you try to do substitution here, you'll say u equals 1 plus x squared. Then du will be 2x. And you're not going to be able to get rid of that x. No? But what actually is the antiderivative? Ten. Almost 10. Uh, arc -tan. Uh, Derivative arc -tan. By the way, it was a, uh, well, this is not the whole problem, but there was a problem I put on a quiz when I taught this course a few years ago, and nobody got this problem. I mean, maybe a couple of people did, but out of 70 students, you know, maybe like four people got it. So I stuck it on the next quiz, and then like 10 people got it. And I put it on the midterm, and maybe a third of the people got it. Same exact problem, and it all came down to just knowing this. So I kept putting it on every single quiz the rest of the term, and I even put it on the final exam, and still only like 80% of people got it. <laughs> this was really disheartening. They may, get it, they may have gotten perfect scores on the rest of the thing, but you will still forget this. So this is one of my favorites. So I'm trying to remember. Okay. Uh, well, geez, I feel really bad that we, we didn't solve this problem in the beginning. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe we should try it again, since I've run out of good examples. Okay, so we were stuck here with this, this nasty integral. x over, well, I don't like this square root. Let me write it 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. What might we try here? Substitution. Substitution. Well, that's not a bad idea. All right, what should be my u? All right, let's try it. Let's hope we don't get into this problem again. All right, so if u equals 1 minus x squared, then du equals? Minus 2x. Minus 2x. Dx. Okay, so or if we like dx equals du over negative 2x. It's actually all the same work as we did right here. Okay, so I can rewrite this as the integral of x over u to the 1 half times dx, which is du over minus 2x. And now we get what we want. These x's cancel, right? Before, when we didn't have this x on top, they didn't cancel. And it's funny because you'd think if you had an x, that somehow makes the thing harder, right? But in this case, it actually makes it easier. Okay. We can cancel the x's, 
and pull out the minus 2. And we just get, well, 1 over u to the 1 half is the same as u to the minus 1 half. And now we can employ the power rule. So we get a half. All right, now u to the minus 1 half. So it's going to be u to the, we've got to add 1 to minus a half. That gives you plus a half. And then you have to do 1 over a half. See? Okay, so what's 1 over a half? 2, and so of course this 2 will cancel already. Like 2 times a half, that's 1. So we get minus u to the 1 half, but u was 1 minus x squared. The 1 half plus, or if you don't like exponents, minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. So we can now plug this back in up here. That good. Minuses will cancel. And so the antiderivative of arc sign is going to be uh, x arc sine of x minus minus plus the square root of one minus x. I never would have guessed. Oh, wow. We got through that very quickly. Questions? Is this pretty reasonable? Want to see another example, or should we try something different? It's really up to you. I understand this already. Well, so. You want to see another example? Okay, let's do another example. Let's do one related to something we've already done. Sine of x times e to the cosine. Okay, so we have a product, so that suggests it's possibly integration by parts, but we also have a composition of functions, right? E is the outside function, cosine is the inside function. Okay, so that suggests substitution. And when you have to choose between substitution or integration by parts, well, substitution is easy, right? Somehow it's, it's just half. Work. So, so let's give it a shot. So since when you do substitution, you're supposed to let the u be the thing inside, let's give it a shot. Let's make this bit our u. So u equals cosine of x. du will equal negative sine dx. Okay, so we make this substitution, and we get, let's see, integral of sine of x, e to the u, and then dx. Well, dx is going to be what? du divided by minus sine. Minus that pulls out, no problem, but look at that, sine of x and sine of x just go away. So we get minus the integral e to the u du, which is equal minus e to the u plus c, minus e to the cosine of x plus c. Okay, so what's the moral? <laughs> The moral of the story is when you get these nasty integration problems and there's something that looks like a chain rule thing, if it was differentiation, then you say, okay, fine, I want to use substitution. Now, how do I know if it's going to work ahead of time? Well, what you need is that 
when you take the derivative of your perspective u, that it should somehow give you all the other junk. Right? So over here, when you took the derivative of 1 minus x squared in your head, you said, oh, that's going to be minus 2x. So we better cancel some other x. But there was no other x to cancel. Right? You somehow got too much. But when we went over here, now when you took the derivative, minus 2x, right, it's going to cancel with this x. And over here, you say, okay, I have this cosine that I want to substitute for. And when I take its derivative, I'm going to get a sign. So I better be able to cancel with a, with a sign. And boom, there was one. If we dropped this sign, this wouldn't work anymore. When we went here and we went to cancel, right, we wouldn't have had it and we would have just been left with the sign of x. So this is very bad. So what's very strange about this is what it means is if you have an integral that you don't know how to solve, well, you can sometimes build an integral you want to solve by multiplying it by something. Right? You didn't know how to solve either the cosine of x, you'd say, well, yeah, but if there was a sign, I would be okay. So you put a sign in and now you can't solve. Of course, it didn't help you with the original one, but you know, you've solved some, solving something without nothing. Okay. This idea is actually the basis for the next thing I want to talk about, which is the integrating factor method. And this has to do with solving differential equations again. something you multiply by. Yeah? These are, well usually, if you take a number, you can break it up into its prime factors. These are things that multiply together to give you what you want. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with a differential equation, specific form, namely a first order linear differential equation. And we're going to say we don't know how to solve it. But if we multiply by something, then we will. So first, let's just recall. Uh, this is a first order differential equation. Why? 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 Um, what makes it first order? There's a first derivative, right? That's the only one. Okay, there's no second derivative this okay. Is it linear? Yeah. Well, let's see. Linear means, okay, you go down and you check all the derivatives, right? And y counts as, as a derivative, right? The zero derivative. And you look in front of those derivatives, and you say, is there a function of t and only of t in front? Sure, there's a constant function, no problem. Here's a function of t, no problem. And on the other side, you need to have a function of t. Boom, function of t, no problem. Okay, so this is first order linear differential equation. The only way it, it could be more general, right, is if you had a function in front. But let's say I had a function in front. What if I just divide everything by that function? Well, then this will have a 1, and this will be a function of t divided by a function of t, which is again a function of t. And this would be a function of t divided by a function of t, which is again a function of t. So if I had the most general first order linear differential equation, I could always just divide and put it back into this form. So this is really the most, this is as general as we need to be. This is the general first order linear differential equation. Okay. And I'm going to give you a method of solving. Okay. So here's the problem. We have this differential equation. There's this derivative. Things are nasty. Okay. We don't know if we, we, I mean, we can't even try to integrate at this point. We just, we're just lost. Okay. We don't know what to do. And so what we want to find is something to multiply by 
some function of t to multiply by that will make this something that we can differentiate or integrate rather. Okay. So we want to find some function u of t such that if I multiply this whole equation by u of t, So such that I can integrate both sides of the following. I want this somehow to be nicer. If this was e to the cosine of x or t, I'd want to multiply by sine of t. Sine of x. Because then I can do it. Okay. That's, that's my goal. Right? This looks a little weird, but in the end, we'll get a really nice little algorithm. All right, now, let's forget about this side. This isn't so bad, right? Integrating this, and it's just a function. But over here, you got all these differential equations, and it's nasty. Now, can you think of this function as a derivative of something? Well, can you think of a situation where you start with a function, or maybe multiple functions. And when you take the derivative, you end up with a sum of functions. And in the first term, you have your, one of your original functions, and then you have the derivative of one of them. What? There's a rule that, that has that property. When you take the derivative of the certain form, that you get just the first one times the derivative of the second, plus and then you get something else, which is the mirror image, right? Not quite the chain rule, because there's no plus in the chain rule. The product rule. Right, remember what the product rule said. If I take the derivative two functions, right? It's f g prime plus f prime g. Now look here. This function, if I want to view it as the derivative of a product, right, what should it be? Well, here, think of it on the right side, right? I have the u of t, that's my f, and the y prime, that, that's my g prime. So then the other term would have to be f prime g. So that would mean that this u of t, p of t, y should equal, well, f prime, f was supposed to be the u. Right? There's my f and there's my g prime. So u, t, p, t, y should be f prime, so u prime, g prime, or g rather, right? Well, if g prime is y prime, then g should be y. So if this really was a derivative of a product of u of t and y, then I would have to have that this right-hand side is actually the same as this right-hand. Okay. Now, if that was true, well, I could divide by y. Okay. So then I would have u of t, p of t, is equal to u prime of t. Okay, and if that was true, then, well, p of t could be written as u prime of t divided by u of t. Time do we have to? Oh, wow. Okay. All right, so I need to somehow choose my u so that the derivative of u divided by u actually equals p of t. We can do a little bit more. We can actually say a little bit more. Here's another challenge problem. Can you think of a function that when I differentiate it, I end up with 1 over a function times the derivative of that function? Ln, yeah? Okay, what would happen if I differentiated ln of a function u? 
what do I get? One over u. One over u times u prime. Times u prime, right? Or u prime over u. So actually, this u prime of t over u of t is just the derivative of ln of u, right? Or absolute value of u. So this means that p of t is equal to the derivative with respect to t of ln of the absolute value of u. this dt over so that I can integrate. p of t dt equals d ln absolute value of t. And now I integrate. I don't know what the antiderivative of p of t is because I didn't tell you what it was. So I'm stuck on that side. Okay. But of course, what's the integral of d ln of u of t? <coughs> ln of u of t. Okay. Now I don't like this ln here. So. How can I get rid of my ln? Raise everything, right? So, uh, if I take e and raise it to this, I'll get absolute value of u of t. Now, at this point, let me just say, if I found one u of t and it was negative, let me just flip it around and make it positive, okay? So that I don't have to worry about these absolute values. So let's just assume we even found one which is, is always positive. Okay, so I can drop my absolute value. So now u of t is e to the integral of p of t dt. So this is actually quite nice because it says I start with my general first order linear differential equation. And if I take this p of t, just the p of t, just this nice function, right? I integrate it, and I take e and raise it to that power, I get a function u of t that I can multiply by. Right? And if I multiply everything by it, then I actually get to rewrite this whole side here as just u of t times y derivative. Because the derivative of this would be u of t times y prime plus u prime of t times y. And we just showed that if you make this definition, then actually this whole bit will be u prime of t. Okay, so this is, this is very nice. Uh, well, let's go further even. Let's go even further. Oh, by the way, I, there's something here. When we do this antiderivative, all right, we actually, you know, we should get plus a constant everywhere. Okay, but you can choose any of them in this case that you want. So I just always choose it with k equal to zero, or c equal to zero. Uh, good, good, good. Okay. So. So we did this whole thing so that I could rewrite this left-hand side as u of t times y derivative. Okay? We, we, all, all these choices we made were based on assuming that we could find such a u of t. Right? And in the end, we did find one. It would have to be this. So we have u of t 
times y prime is equal to the other side, u of t times g of t. Okay, so if u of t times y prime is u of t g of t, then I, I can integrate both sides. Right? And I'll get, well, the prime will go away. So u of t times y should equal the integral of u of t times g of t. But of course, when you integrate, you're going to pick up a constant. Over here, I, I didn't just get one, not just one any derivative plus any constant. Now let me divide by u of t to isolate y. So I get integral of u of t, g of t plus c, divided by, well, u of t. And lo and behold, what we've done is we've started with a first order linear differential equation. And remember the goal of differential equations is to solve the differential equations, to find a function y which works. And this gives you a formula for it. This tells you how to find a y that satisfies that linear differential equation. Of course, you have to know what this u of t is, which means you have to actually compute this one too, right? So there's, there's some work going into this, right? Nothing's for free, but at least you have a method. So let me give you an example. Okay, so I, I, let me write this down here. So y prime 2 t y t. And just so that we can get a nice particular solution at the end, let me give you the data point. Right, y is 0 is 0. That way, in the end, right, we can actually we don't have to have the C floating around. Okay, so first let's check if this satisfies the form. Okay, so y prime plus a function of t times y equals a function of t. Okay, y prime plus a function of t, so that's my p of t times y equals a function of t. There's my g of t. Okay, so it satisfies it. So if we want to solve this differential equation, then what this method tells us is first compute u of t. So u of t is going to be e to the integral of p of t dt, which is e to the integral of, well, p of t is 2 times t. So what's the integral of 2t? Which function has as its derivative 2t? t squared. So I get e to the t squared. Okay, and remember I said we, we always just choose as our constant 0. Because right? we, 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 I mean, we can choose a lot of different u's. There's not just one u that will work. Any of the ones plus c should work, but we'll just always choose the simplest one, plus, plus 0. Okay, so there's our u of t. And so now this tells us that our y is equal to, well, we have the integral of, we have put u of t, e to the t squared, times g of t, which is t. And then, oh, we left a dt out in our formula. Plus c divided by u of t, so if we get e to the t squared. All right, so this is nice because we've now reduced the solving of this differential equation to solving this one integral, the integral of e to the t squared times t. Let's rewrite that. y is supposed to be the integral of e to the t squared times t dt plus c 
over e to the c squared. Okay, so let's integrate e to the t squared times t. That looks pretty nasty. Anybody want to suggest a method? Last one. Hmm? Last one. We mean last one. I mean that, that one. Yeah, yeah, for this, right? So we need this to solve that. Substitution, okay, not a bad idea. What's going to be your u? T squared. T squared. Let's try. Okay, so if u is t squared, then du to t dt. Okay, so we get the integral of e to the u times t times, okay, now dt is du divided by 2t. And ah, how nice. The t's cancel, the 2 pops out. We get a half integral of e to the u du which is a half e to the u plus c, right? But we know in the end we don't need to worry about the c because there's already a plus c floating around. So we just drop that. And this is, of course, a half e. Well, u is t squared. So it's going to t squared. Okay, so I can plug this back in. And I get a half e to the t squared plus c divided by e to the t squared. And this will break up. All right, it's two fractions. This one over this one plus c over e to the t squared. And when I break that up, well, the first one just becomes a half because you get a cancellation. And then you get plus c. I could write it over e to the t squared. And I could write it e to the minus t squared. I want to keep it on one. So you have to do some work, you have to evaluate some integrals, but you have a method now. That should give you, I mean, in principle, it can solve any first order linear differential equation. Except you might get to a point where you don't know how to integrate something. That, that's the limiting factor here. Yeah, the limiting factor, the integrating factor method is the factor that you may not be able to integrate. Okay, so uh, next week I'll write up some, a bunch of homework problems in, in practice integration by parts, substitution, the integrating factor method. Uh, if you have questions over the weekend on these things, feel free to write me or on anything else. I can't answer questions about most things in the universe. But Math is okay. Homework uh, three, do a next one. Yes, homework three, yeah, which is up, is available now. Uh, I decided not to make it as long as I wanted to, uh, but all those problems I'm just going to push off to next week. You'll get them eventually because they're good problems. I just uh, don't want to overload you all at once. I'll overload you over time. Break your spirits, that's what I say. Okay, well, have a nice weekend for those of you I don't see.